Hi, my name is Julie Ann Link and welcome to The Music Link. This week on the Let's Link project, I'd like to welcome the bassoon teacher at the Oberlin Conservatory of Music and who runs the Practice Academy blog, Drew Pattison. Thank you so much for being here, Drew. Thank you, Julie, for having me. This is really exciting. I've watched some of the interviews and love them, so I can't wait to uh, talk to you today. Drew and I met about 10 years ago in Oberlin through the Meg Quigley Vivaldi competition and symposium. So Drew, just to start out, could you please share an overview of who you are and what you do as a professional musician? Sure. So, and are we the same year, Julie? Are we, I was 2010. I graduated from my undergrad in 2009. So I think maybe uh, I'm a year older. Oh, oh yeah. You're at CIM? <laughs> I did my undergrad in Arizona at Arizona okay. State University and then did my master's at CIM. Okay, okay. That's, I must have some, I connected you there. Cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Anyway, sorry. So an overview of who I am. I teach bassoon at Oberlin and I'm mostly playing solo stuff now and making YouTube videos and writing blog articles and all kinds of other content stuff. Um, I'm working on a practice course I've become really passionate about practice and, you know, sort of what kind of practice leads to good technique and reliable technique and the ability to play an audition really accurately. Um, I finally understood that was my missing link to, to my whole, um, you know, just, just problem with that sort of thing. And so I've become really passionate about that over the last few years. And um, I sub with orchestras when I can, but I'm mainly just teaching it over the now and trying to make content. Drew, could you tell us about where you grew up? Yeah, so I grew up in Tallahassee, Florida, and I studied with Kim Woolley, and who teaches now, I think, in Mississippi, uh, and Randy Dew, and Chris Schaub, and some of Jeff Kieseker's other students from Florida State, and they were all awesome teachers, really fun people, and so that was sort of the Florida State University bubble was where I grew up. Wow. So how did you first get introduced to music and playing the bassoon? Oh, that's a really good question. I think I just joined band in sixth grade and was like, okay, I, I knew what a bassoon was. And there was a girl before me who wanted to play bassoon, but someone had told her that it was called oboe. So she got the only oboe and thankfully I got the only bassoon uh, because she was handed the wrong instrument and it didn't figure it out before, you know, she, her last name was L and it got to me. So um, anyways, I did that. And, you know, another person in Tallahassee was um, Alexander Jimenez is the conductor at Florida state, but he, uh, the orchestra conductor there, but he did the youth orchestra. And so he was another big inspiration. My band directors, Brian Dell, Carmen Williams, Josh Bula, uh, these people were just, you know, um, really inspiring and, and sort of the band world got me into music. And I remember playing Sibelius too in a community band and just thinking, wow, this is good music. Like this is, you know, I, I, I really like to Kelly, but this Sibelius is amazing. I can't wait to play this in orchestra someday. So um, that's sort of where I came up, you know, musically and that's how I got introduced, I guess. Mm. So getting that, you know, passion for music from band, did you always know that you wanted to pursue music as a career? Uh, no, I, I didn't know I wanted to do it. I wanted to be a lawyer as a kid and I just sort of, just sort of worked out this way. Um, I remember I liked arguing and studying and right and wrong and classics and Latin um, but by the end of high school, I think music was just the thing I was most into, was most inspired by. So that's, that's where I ended up. Drew, where did you go to college and what were the music programs like there for you? So I went to Oberlin and then DePaul and then Colburn. And they were all different and wonderful in their own way. Oberlin was really supportive. Um, and nurturing and, you know, maybe overly, almost overly parental at times. Uh, and then DePaul was really wonderfully decentralized and kind of like lean in a way and in a good way. And it just sort of, there's no nonsense. 
um, and it was the real world and we all lived all over Chicago and, and it was cool. And then um, Colburn was really hardcore and really intense and really helped me push my playing to a higher level of reliability. Um, and it's of course beautiful in LA, but um, you know, and each of my teachers at those schools, Sakakini and Bookman and Bean were also awesome in their own ways. And they, they each gave me just invaluable lessons. So, mm -hmm. Could you share more about your music teachers and, and how they influenced you today? Yeah. Um, I mean, of course they taught me lots of like fingerings and stuff and all that crap, but you know, they taught me about the big picture and like just to sort of be generous and share what I know with other people. Um, that's maybe the greatest thing, their generosity, spending extra time with me, giving me their best knowledge, you know, and just handing it to me on a silver platter, right? Like I don't have to figure out how to make a read, you know, or I don't have to figure out what a great bassoon sound is. Somebody said, here it is. And all I had to do was listen to them. And, and it, you know, so they just were so generous with their knowledge and everything. And um, they, they all taught me what they were best at. And um, I don't know. I mean, they, they all taught me, you know, unique ideas. And then from that, I was trying to figure out, well, what's sort of the first principle is like, what, what underlies all of this and how can I unify all these different read styles and playing styles and all that? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was, it was just great. I learned something unique from all of them. Hmm. Are there any tips and advice that you could share about what you learned about the music industry since graduating and working professionally? Definitely. That's a really good, um, good question. Uh, I think mostly it's, I realize it's more of a bubble when you're in school um, because it, it feels great. And you and all your friends and all the people you know your age are doing this and you have a place and you have a place in orchestra and you have a chamber music group and you have classes and you have this whole system. And when you get out in the real world, unless you go and win an orchestra job right away, you're, you're not gonna have that structure. Um, and so I guess, yeah, I just realized the world's a harsher place. Um, I realized there's a lot of luck involved and that's not to say don't do it. I wouldn't change my path. Um, you know, I just think, know that school is a bit of a bubble. And even if you get right into an orchestra, you're not going to have, you know, 75 people who are your exact same age. And then 75 people a year older than you and 75 people a year older than that. Like you're just, you're not going to ever have that level of um, community, I think. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, um, just be aware of that. And, you know, don't take it for granted, I guess. Hmm. Did you ever consider changing careers outside of music? Sure. Oh, sure. I mean, I, I still do. Honestly, sometimes I think about, wow, you know, I'll listen to some podcast. I'm always listening to some tech podcast or startup podcast and think, wow, that is so cool. Or some kind of, you know, Bitcoin thing or just, you know, some finance thing where it's like, well, this could really change people's lives. This could give people the power to do things that they've never had before. And um, so sure, I think about that stuff all the time. And um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, but yeah. I think definitely, and um, that's why I like writing the blog and trying to make videos and learning different software. And over the, when the pandemic started, I was trying to learn all this streaming stuff. And so learning the technology behind that and mics and learning OBS, which is the open broadcaster software. It was so fun and managing all the different mics and the different cameras and um, getting the lighting and uh, just, you know, there's so many fascinating things out there. I certainly think about doing other stuff, but that's not to say I'm not incredibly grateful for what I have here. And I love playing the bassoon. I love the students at Oberlin. I love teaching. I love my colleagues here. So it's, you know, it's amazing too. Um, but I've never been one of the people who's just sort of, I could never do anything else. You know, I could do other stuff. Yeah. I, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's been really humbling or just with the pandemic now where musicians uh, and, and, you know, just starting out as well are learning how to do these recordings and videos and starting their YouTube channels. And so, you know, the definition of a music career is definitely 
um, yeah. evolving and changing and um, yeah. yeah, and good to um, stay open-minded. Yeah, you must enjoy that too. I mean, doing this such a huge project and I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to call it. It's like, I mean, it's not a podcast because it's video interview series, YouTube page. Like, what do you call it? What do you? Yeah. Um, I love what you said, Drew, about community where, um, so yeah, about a year ago was really, you know, wanting to connect. And so reaching out to the bassoon community has been so um, soul fulfilling. Um, and so started the music link as a resource um, for all musicians, really. And then this link, uh, Let's Link project is more um, bassoon uh, related, where there are just a couple events each week where there's like a, a YouTube interview um, on Thursdays and then doing these live discussions where, you know, people can get to know guests better through the interview and then and then doing these live discussions where we can continue the conversation. And so, um, yeah, it's really, but, and like you were saying, like learning how to build a website and, um, you know, create uh, just like different email addresses and um, in some ways, even like uh, programming and doing different coding and, um, you know, and with learning Zoom too was a huge learning curve. So, but love just learning new things. And um, that's been really wonderful. So, um, yeah, I would love to hear more, Drew, about um, your teaching career. Would you want to share um, any of your philosophies and um, with us? Yeah, well, I... I remember I started a family friend, Sarah Logan, who it was in sixth grade, and I think I was in eighth or ninth grade. I think I was, I can't even remember, but I started teaching her, and she was so good. She was the most amazing student. She was so, she learned so fast, and I'm sure I was absolutely terrible teacher, but like she was just amazing. She was always motivated, and she always practiced, and um, but then throughout college, I would just sit in studio class, and I would think to myself, like, what like one sentence could I say to this person to make them sound better? And then I would sort of see if the teacher said that thing or they said something else or they said something better or they said something way too long-winded and that didn't work. And the person played worse actually after you made that really long comment. You know, so I just sat in studio class for all my years and just tried to practice in my head teaching. Um, and then I got to... Texas. I played a one year in the Houston Grand Opera and living in Houston, you had as many students as you wanted, basically. And I got to teach a ton every single week. And I feel like I really cut my teeth there and just got to, you know, I don't know, just practice teaching. Like I would practice the bassoon before that, just tons and tons and tons of teaching. And so I got to hone my teaching then. Um, so I guess that's really, I taught it to Paul for three, four years before I came to Oberlin. So that was some great collegiate teaching experience. And um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, just a lot of reflecting on what my teachers did with me, what worked, what, what I liked. And then of course I still record my teaching all the time and watch the video of it and see, Ooh, you know, that's not great teaching. And so it's always trying to get better. Hmm. Could you tell us more about your chamber music career? Sure. I, um, I love playing chamber music. I get to play a lot now with my colleagues and Alexa, still the flute professor here at Oberlin and I play a lot together. Just, she also teaches at round top. So we've gotten to do a number of things here and then round top and we've gotten to play some really cool trios and trios with piano. And we played the Villa Lobos duet and, um, that's been super fun. Uh, so I love playing chamber music because it's, you know, you've got somebody else to just connect with and, and, you know, there's nothing more human than just looking into someone's eyes when you're playing and just having some connection and some shared, shared insight or shared emotion. And um, she's particularly wonderful for that. She just is such an expressive player. Um, so I'm always looking for, for stuff like that. I'm trying to think of other chamber music careers. I played a lot of chamber music in Chicago, uh, freelancing and stuff. When I was in Civic, I played in this wonderful quintet that was, we did a lot of outreach. We'd do 20 outreach concerts a year in various parks and 
uh, community centers and just various places around Chicago. And we had this whole script and program and we'd all pile into somebody's tiny car and like drive all the way across Chicago and we'd get out of the little clown car. And I remember one time we'd parked weird or something. So we just kind of lifted the back of her car, like all five of us lifted the car and moved it into the parking spot. Um, but anyways, that was an amazing experience because we would go and then we'd all pile back into the clown car and like talk about the script and like that part didn't work. You know, can you, can you say it this way? Can you try saying this? Can you don't, don't say that it confuses the kids. And I remember we we're doing Ligeti and we would have like a group, we'd have a, an auditorium of elementary school kids and we'd have them clapping uh, septuplets back and forth to each other. It was amazing, like how if you set it, if you set it up right and you set it correctly, you could get elementary school kids to clap sevens back and forth, half the audience, half the audience, it, you know, like the clarinet and bassoon and whatever the movement that is. And then, but you know, half the time it wouldn't work because somebody would over explain it. It's like, don't say the word septuplet, that's just going to mess people up. But if you, you know, put two people out there and you demonstrate it, um, it can work and they could do it. And it was, it was so cool. So I loved that group. That was a really meaningful chamber music and sort of um, teaching artist, I believe is the is the term. Um, I always say community engagement. That's probably like I'm dating myself. I feel like that's that's what it was when we were in undergrad. And then somewhere when like we were in grad school, it like teaching artist became the term. Okay. Uh, teaching artistry. I feel like, I don't know. So I, Anyway, I love that. And I'm just trying to think of what else. One of my favorite quintets I played in was at Round Top as a student. And it was just, we just clicked somehow. We had like the right balance of some of us were good friends and some of us weren't, not, not we weren't that we weren't good friends, but it was just like the perfect balance that we kept everyone honest. You know, if everyone's best friends, it's almost too close. Like that cannot work. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, we played the Francais first quintet and it was just, just amazing i'll never forget those concerts they just were so much fun and that's one of my favorite chamber pieces of all time but um yeah so i guess that's some of my chamber music career hmm. um hearing more about just simplicity um and sharing you know with really young students and 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 communicating that in a in a you know uh, efficient um and helpful way um, your rhythmics or like Dal um, Dalcros your rhythmics or ORF comes to mind. And that's something I learned about in Ohio and remember like having to go to class with like, they were, you know, maybe four years old wow. and having to introduce the bassoon. And I remember <laughs> it was just such an interesting um, situation where it's like, yeah, we're literally in the practice room being so you know, critical and trying to um, improve. And, and, and then when it comes down to it, it's just like, let's just make this fun. And, um, you know, what, what is this? It's like, well, it's bamboo, <laughs> you know, yeah. or, um, you know, and just how to share things simply. So I really love um, hearing about your thought process around um, just being able to share music in a fun sure. and way. Hmm. Yeah, well, when you mentioned that, it makes me think about sometimes I would go into these concerts and I would like, I'd be trying out some new thing. And so I would play, I made this arrangement of um, Tchaikovsky for bassoon solo for woodwind quintet accompaniment. And I would play that and I would just say like, what's, you know, what, what do you feel? What's the emotion? And it was amazing the responses the kids would give, you know, like if you think they're, oh, they're four and five, like they're not going to get it or whatever, but no, they'd be they'd say, you know, they'd say something simple like, oh, it's sad, but the way they said it was so honest, you know, and it was, it was really cool. I, I can, I feel like never underestimate kids and their capacity. Like adults are way worse, you know, adults will be like, I don't, I don't get this. I don't like classical music. I don't belong. And kids don't care at all. They, they love it. You know, you could play something atonal and they could care less. They think it's really cool, but an adult will be like, I don't get this or, I don't like this or whatever. It's it's funny. Hmm. Drew, could you share with us more about your orchestra career? Sure. So I I play. I mentioned I played a year at the Houston Opera. Um, thank you to Amanda Swain, whom you may know from Texas, I think, um, for having me down there. They had a one year opening, and we had played in Civic together. 
And that was amazing. That was incredible. I learned so much playing next to her and um, just her focus and her ability to, you know, just she's so such a strong player and she can overcome like she plays on this read to me it's so hard and i tried playing her read and i'd be 20 cents flat and she'd try playing my read and it would immediately close up because it was so weak um but you know she's just such an incredible musician and um just so musical and i'll never forget her playing aida you know that that excerpt that that stupid 3p excerpt with like that starts on a g flat and she just destroyed it you know and she was so consistent every night she could play it beautifully an amazing legato and incredible sound um she just has an amazing amazing player anyway so i did that for a year um i freelanced a lot in chicago i got to sub with chicago symphony and milwaukee symphony and um those are amazing experiences i mean to be on stage of the Chicago Symphony and hearing these people all around you playing. I mean, it's like any one of them, you know, could be an amazing soloist and you're getting to hear them that close. And um, that was always so difficult to stay focused on my music because it was like, you could just easily get carried away on any of the 75 players sitting around you. Um, but uh, I played, I was principal in the Elgin Symphony and the Lake Forest Symphonies, which were two regional orchestras in the Chicago area. And um, just had a great time playing there and, you know, some wonderful, wonderful people, wonderful colleagues, really inspiring and great musicians and um, moving concerts. So uh, that's sort of what I did. Just a lot of subbing in these bigger orchestras and then I had my smaller regional things, but I'm really not a very orchestral player. Um, I'm much more, uh, especially at this moment, geared towards solo playing and my playing has certainly become more inconsistent. Um, so in my practice now, I'm always trying to push myself. Okay, I learned this A2 this week. Play it without messing up. Because when you when you mess up in your practice room, you don't care. But when you mess up and you're playing, a, you're subbing with the CSO, you care. Every mistake matters. You're like, wow, I can't mess up. But it's hard to simulate that. So I'm always trying to uh, simulate that kind of intensity and um, reliability in my playing now, uh, so. Is there a favorite concert experience that you've performed in or attended that you could share with us? I don't know. I remember playing um, some Prokofiev Romeo and Juliet at BUTI as a kid in high school and David Hoos was conducting and he was just so passionate about it and it was the most beautiful music it's still one of my absolute favorite pieces. Um, but I just remember him getting so emotional in the concerts. And that was cool to see, you know, somebody, a professional, being that invested and that emotional um, and, and letting themselves, you know, feel that level of intensity. Um, so that's probably my favorite concert I've played. I'm trying to think. Um, I, yeah, I'd have to say something like that. I mean, I, I really enjoyed playing solo recitals. I remember my senior recital being so nervous and having, not nervous, but just the sense of, wow, this is the culmination of my four years of undergrad and here it comes, here it is. Um, I remember playing Tchaikovsky 4 at Music Academy, thinking that was really intense. Um, that was a, an orchestra. I first thought, wow, everybody in here is really good. So I have to, I really have to play super well like i can't play any notes out of tune i can't miss any notes all that sort of stuff um so i remember playing that tchaikovsky four was very meaningful and important um yeah i don't know it's a good question yeah um beautiful um to hear about those drew um could you share about a memorable audition experience with us hmm that's that's a good question um I'm trying to think, you know, they're really tough and they're really intense. And I remember thinking in some audition, you know, that's cool. Like this is a roller coaster that most people never get to ride. And it's cool to feel that level of intensity and that level of pressure. And I mean, that's all I know how to describe it is like sort of like when you're at the start of a roller coaster and you're about to go up that thing with that rickety chain and it sounds like it's going to break or something. And you're just like, you have that sense of anticipation and intensity 
but it's even more, it's even more intense because you've worked. It's like you, you spent three months building the roller coaster and now you're about to ride it and you only get to ride it once. And it's, it's just so intense. Um, but I think that's really cool. It's really, um, interesting. And I guess the other thing I think about with auditions, memorable auditions is like, the best audition that I ever played, I think, or orchestra audition was um, for the Milwaukee Symphony. And I just remember thinking, okay, I finally had figured out how I needed to practice. And, and I knew before I played the audition that I was going to do well. And that was unique, you know? And so then, because I finally figured out, okay, I know how to practice it. I know what it's going to feel like in the audition. And I know what I needed to feel like in the practice room and I got it there. And um, that was, that was really, really memorable to me because I finally felt like, oh, it wasn't nerves. It wasn't anything. It was how I was practicing. It was now I know what I need to do. And then it translated, you know, and of course, once you feel like you know what you need to do and you trust it, you also aren't that nervous anymore. Um, so anyways, we can maybe get into more of that later, but I just think, nerves and auditions are are kind of overblown like i always thought oh i've got nerve i'm nervous i'm nervous that's why i'm messing up and it for me again for other people maybe different of course but for me it i was nervous of course but i'm still nervous but now i know how to practice and so it's fine i remember somebody telling me about you know they saw david mcgill in some audition and and in, i think it was in the finals of the cso and they said even his hand was shaking. He was so nervous about the outcome. And that's when it hit me like, okay, it's it's actually just normal to be nervous. And like doing well in an audition doesn't mean you've taken so many beta blockers that you have zero nerves. You know, it's like you the nerves are going to be there. That's not actually a problem. So I guess, um, yeah, that's what I think about when I think about memorable, memorable auditions is – the nerves to me are very connected to the practice and I'm always going to be nervous. So if I practice in the right way, the stuff I need to have happen will persist through the nerves. And um, if I know I haven't practiced in the right way and I know it's not going to happen, I will be extra nervous because of that. But it's not really the nerves. It's like the nerves are just the signal for how I practiced. Uh, and there's some degree of nerves that are always going to be there. So that's what I, that's what like is memorable to me about auditions. Mm -hmm. Could you share with us a few coping techniques for music performance anxiety and, and, um, you know, aside from, uh, practicing and, and perspective and things like that? Yeah. I mean that I would say for me, that was the most effective thing. I tried all kinds of breathing stuff. I mean, I do, I do some breathing. I mean, I just try to breathe deeply. Um, a high school teacher taught me this meditation mantra. As I breathe in, I calm myself. As I breathe out, I smile. As I breathe in, I rest upon the present moment. As I breathe out, I know that it is wonderful. So sometimes I'll do that. But, you know, in, in, um, you know, inside my head, I'm not saying it out loud, but um, generally I don't do too much. Sometimes I've felt a little low at times and I'll do some push-ups or jumping jacks. Uh, to try to get my energy up. But uh, generally, I'm doing that sort of stuff. Maybe, um, yeah, maybe just some some stretching. Uh, my hands will get cold when I'm really nervous. So sometimes I'll be sort of just shaking my arms to try to heat up my hands. But just trying to breathe, stay calm, notice my breath, notice my body. Stuff from, from yoga, stuff from Alexander Technique. But I don't have anything... I guess I tried all this other stuff. I tried, okay, practice, like run up and down the stairs and then play a mock audition. And like, it didn't, it didn't do much for me. Um, so for me, it was sort of just simple body awareness. I guess another perspective that really helped me in an audition was trying to be more selfish. That sounds bad, but maybe taking a few days before the audition to be all about me and not worry about other people, like maybe be less nice and just be kind of self-centered because you need to hold on to your mental state in an audition. You need to like stand your ground. You cannot let the situation sort of, you know, make you nervous. Like you have to say, I'm doing my thing. I know what I need to do to play this, 
you know, Beethoven four. And so I would try to do that a little bit before auditions too. try to be a little more self-centered. I don't, it's funny because all our words are like negative words for this. So we need like a con, you know, positive connotation, maybe like focused or um, self-care. I feel like these are like positive connotation words in this thing, but that was also really important for me to not get too out of my own head and like, oh, what is the panel going to think of this? Or I'm in this big city. This is such a cool city. What if I lived here? Like none of that helped. You know, I needed to be much more internally focused and saying, okay, about to play Beethoven 4. I'm not, I'm breathing to about here. Like that's what I needed to be aware of rather than like worrying about the panel or worrying about the hall or any of that crap. It's like I needed to be internally focused. So um, that's another thing I would say to try to practice. Great advice. Have you experienced any music related injuries? Not really, thankfully. Um, I've had some, like not tendonitis, but just some, you know, sort of forearm flare up. And I just sort of checked back in with my yoga teachers have taught me and my Alexander teachers have taught me and just noticed the tension and stayed calm and did not power through it, but just sort of use self-awareness to get through it and release the tension. So. Could you tell us about your reed making style and techniques? Sure, sure. I'm somewhere between, I'd say, like a Sakakini and a Caymans Hertzberg, um, you know, uh, and, and built, but, you know, so Bean and uh, Bookman, my two grad school teachers, sort of are making a Hertzberg reed. They're using Hertzberg shape. They're, they each, of course, have a different flavor of it, as does Ben Caymans, who's maybe the the modern successor to Hertzberg. Ben Caymans and Ryan Crapo, of course, have Banana of Life, which is a great book. And then, you know, my undergrad is George Sakakini. He has a great uh, book on Apple Books, too. It's something just like making a read start to finish. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm somewhere between those two. So I'd say... I usually have a back around 33 thousandths of an inch. So I'm not a, a completely a wedge scrape like a traditional uh, Cayman's reed, mm -hmm. but I'm not um, I'm not also a more parallel scrape like Sakakini's reed. Mm -hmm. um, but, and his isn't even totally parallel, like a, maybe a Clouser reed or a Garfield reed where the back is really equal to the front or even lower than the front. So. But I guess my my read philosophy is just very open, and I'm I was talking to Bill Bookman today. Actually, he was coming through Oberlin um, about you know maybe I should be a little more dogmatic. <laughs> I tend to hear everybody, and I say, okay, wow, Clauser sounds amazing. I want to get that, and Barry Stees sounds amazing. I want to sound like that, and Sakini sounds amazing, and Caymans, and Chris Millard, and all these people, and I just. I tend to want everything of all the styles. And I think that's obviously a little unrealistic, but I'm just trying to find my happy medium between all the styles and what works for my bassoon and the way I want to play. And, you know, yeah, what read style is going to optimize the way I want to play. So that's sort of where I am with reads right now is just somewhere between a lot of different things, but mm -hmm. I'm always searching, you know, always searching for something new. Mm-hmm. Drew, in one of your recent blogs, you touch on these points, um, but would love to hear more about important skills that are learned through music that apply to everyday life. Could you share some of those with us? Sure. I mean, I think some of the big ones are, are like solving your own problems and self-discipline, making yourself work hard every single day. I mean, if whatever you want to do, if you just treat it like music and you practice three, four hours a day, you're probably going to get there. I mean, that's, that's just so valuable. If it's writing, if it's making an Instagram page of, you know, like whatever business or job you want to have, like just do it every day and you'll get good at it, you know? So, um, I think that's so valuable. Um, I don't know. That's the first, that's what's coming to my mind right mm -hmm. now. Is there any um, final advice that you could share for musicians just starting out their music careers? Yeah. Um, 
That's a really good question. I'm trying to think of what I, I jotted some notes down here. Mm -hmm. um, I would say just, you know, be smart with money, you know, be careful with all the, all the debt and all that, and know that bassoons cost, I mean, a professional bassoon is at least $20,000 now, you know, um, so factor that in. And um, I would say to figure out what else you would do if you can't make money in music, because it's, it involves a lot of luck. Um, they're just too many people and they're not enough jobs. So know what else you would want to do to make some money. Um, I would say focus all your extracurricular stuff in that. Learn some coding, learn HTML, learn, learn design stuff, you know, learn, you know, go learn Kino right now, go learn Adobe Illustrator right now. Um, YouTube makes, there's, there's tutorials for absolutely everything. There's sort of no excuse. So um, that would be my advice. And of course, you know, be incredibly devoted and be, be incredibly hardworking, be open, learning from everyone. Um, but the biggest thing I would say is just, you got to go and solve your own problems. Like no teacher is, is going to make or break you. It doesn't matter what school you go to. It doesn't matter. Like, it just doesn't matter. So you, what really matters is you solving your own problems, solve whatever your teacher tells you to solve, but go ahead and solve two or three things in addition every week, you know, and say, I have this problem, even if it, you know, really specific stuff, my tenor notes are flat. I'm going to figure this out. You know, my teacher told me, whatever, practice more double tonguing, fine, do that too. And then go and solve your own problems because it's the only way. I mean, there's just too many things to fix. So like no teacher is going to be able to, to fix everything for you. And so I think that's the one skill that, um, is more important than anything else is just like improve your playing on your own. It's the only way, you know. Drew, is there anyone that you would be interested to suggest to be interviewed next for this project? Sure. If you haven't already interviewed him, I think Max Pippinich is an excellent teacher and player and person, and he's super smart and super honest and just a really interesting guy. And I love talking to him about music and reads and everything else. So Wonderful. I'd love to reach out to Max. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you, Drew. So I really appreciate this opportunity to interview you. And it's wonderful to get a glimpse into your life and career as a professional musician. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Music for me was an emotional outlet. And I think it's still really important as that, especially in very turbulent times to have a place to express yourself if you don't have a therapist or something else or friends that can listen to you or you feel comfortable telling your not most embarrassing, but your, your most vulnerable emotions to music can be that. So, you know, use it as that tool. Um, and then I think just, you know, seek out transparency, find people who um, are going to be really honest with you about the realities of music and the realities of your playing. And, you know, are you, are you going to get, are you going to be competitive for an orchestra job? And what are your, you know, what else is going to happen? Uh, what other skills do you have? That sort of thing I think is really important. And then something else, you know, you mentioned with the doing other, you know, do you ever consider doing other things? I would say just get, get on like podcasts are incredible to me. I do a lot. I listen to a lot of podcasts and it's just amazing the way it's all out there for free. You're getting to hear people tell their best insights about life and it's all for free and it's all just out there. And so I would say, start listening to some podcasts. There's this really cool app called shuffle that lets you clip podcasts and lets you share clips of podcasts. And um, it's a good way to discover new podcasts I found too. But yeah, if you don't know what else you're interested in outside of music, like start listening to some podcasts and you know, something will, will intrigue you, I think. So Mm. Beautiful advice, Drew. Well, thank you so much. And um, for everyone tuning in, keep an eye out for two events held every week on the Music Link. Every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, a new YouTube interview video launches. 
and every Sunday Central Standard Time, a live Zoom discussion session is shared. And you can register for this on the Music Link website. Check out Drew's hosting session coming up this Sunday. Find out more about Drew at drewbassoon.com, which is spelled D-R-E-W-B-S-N.com and practice.drewbassoon.com and subscribe to his YouTube channel, Drew Pattison, for more great videos. Please like, comment, and share any questions or feedback in the section below and subscribe for notifications for further support for the music link. Check out the Instagram and Facebook pages too for more information. The music link is a New Zealand-based online resource for people to share, learn, and connect. Thank you for watching and I'll see y'all in the next video.